Tonight we're looking at the final lesson in our series on reasons why. We've been looking at reasons why I cannot join your denomination, and we have looked at various denominations, and we looked at how last week how uh, the reason why we cannot join denominations because the church which Christ built does in fact exist today. And our final lesson deals with the reasons why I cannot join your, your denomination because the church of the Bible needs restoration. I want you to notice with me Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, and this won't be on the screen. Now this is our key text this evening. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. This is where we stand still today, encouraging one another and those who are not part of the body of Christ to return to the Bible pattern, to return to the Bible way. If religious division is to end, the church must be restored and denominationalism must come to an end. Religious division in, the, in this lesson is used in a sense of denominationalism. We understand that unfortunately there exists various divisions even among the Lord's church, but for what we're talking about this evening, we're, we'll be using that term uh, religious division to refer to the denominational bodies which we see around us today. We'll begin by looking at the need for restoration. One of the, one of the first needs or reasons we need restoration today is because of the results of rest, because of the result of religious division. Those who depart from truth and embrace teachings of man will only be separated from God. Notice with me Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 10. Here the Bible says, Who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. We understand this verse to mean, to basically we understand it to mean that tell us things that we, it would be easy for us to follow, that we would enjoy, not things that would cause us to have to change how we would have to live. That is our modern day application of that, isn't it? You notice there he says in verse 10, who say to the seers do not see, and to the prophets do not prophesy to us right things, Speak to us smooth things. Now those smooth things are those things which anyone would have no problem in following, no problem uh, obeying, no problem implementing in their lives. And he goes on to say, prophesy deceits. That is, tell us things that we know are false, but we know also that they are smooth, they are easy to be followed. You know, too, too, too much today we find those individu find individuals who... When they look at the Bible, they look at it as a list of commands or a list of do's and don'ts, and they forget that it's not a list of do's and don'ts, but it's the commands of God. And if we ever approach the Bible with the attitude that it is too difficult, I want something easier, then we have to realize the Bible is not the problem, is it? The problem instead is our own heart. If we ever look at the Bible and say, well, that sounds really tough, I'm not willing to do that, I'm going to find something else I'm going to do. Well, that is not pleasing in the sight of God. Let's continue looking, if you will, with me. We're going to be going to Titus chapter 1 in a moment. We notice that those who follow traditions of men are turned from the truth of God's Word. In Titus 1, beginning in verse 14, he says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Now, fables are those stories we sometimes tell our children that we know they're not true, and we tell our children they're not true, but they're just there for entertainment value, maybe some type of humorous story, but it might teach us some general simple lesson. But a fable we find here, he says, not giving heed to Jewish fables, because why? He says, the Jewish fables and the commandments of men, they turn what? Who turn from the truth. The truth there, you notice again, is used in a singular sense. The truth, not turned from a truth. They turn from the truth. There's only one. 
And so these Jewish fables and these commandments of men turn from the truth. He goes on to say in verse 15, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. And notice verse 16. He says here, They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Now, doesn't that go right against what Paul told us there in Timothy? That God has given to us, uh, the, the, the Word of God is inspired. It is proper for us, good for what? For, for, for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But we find here those who are not following God are disqualified for every good work because they're not following the Word of God. That means no matter what they do and how sincere it may be, if they're not doing it according to God's pattern, then it is disqualified. It's not pleasing the sight of God. We hear people say all the time, well, they're very sincere, and that's fine, but sincerity does not replace truth, does it? It does not replace obedient, commandment-following followers of Christ. He says there in verse 16, they profess... To know God. Doesn't, it sound like, doesn't that sound like denominationalism? They profess to know God, but in works, and notice in works, they deny Him. That is by what they do, which would include, but also what they teach. They deny God. And being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified, notice, for every good work. Why? Because they have appearance of righteousness, but it's only in appearance. That's why it's important that we encourage others and encourage those in the church as well to remind them of the importance of restoring true New Testament Christianity. What do we mean by that? We mean we go back and we look at the New Testament, which we are under today, and we see what God has commanded and we follow it and it only. We cast aside any man-made doctrine or creed because those things, as we see here in verse 14, they will turn you from the truth. And thus we must restore the New Testament church. Another reason we have a need for restoration is not just because of the, the division we find in the religious world, but also because salvation is not found in denominationalism. Salvation is not found in a denomination. Because why? Because it's not based upon the Word of God. Look at Matthew 16 and verse 18, which we have several times throughout this series of lessons. We know that salvation is only found in Christ's church, and He only built one. Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, we know and understand the rock is the, is the confession which Peter made previously that Christ is the Son of God. Upon that rock, he says, I will build my church, and thus excluding any other church, but only one. And he tells us, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Against it. Thus, there's only one church. And so if we're a member of some other group that claims to be a church, we are not pleasing the sight of God. We have our hopes resting upon the foundations of men and not upon the foundations which the church is built upon. That is, that Christ is the Son of God, and that's who we obey. The denominationalism may claim it, but their works deny it. Their beliefs deny it. Their creed books deny it. Their bylaws deny it. And the name on their signs deny it. We must realize if we are going to restore New Testament Christianity, we must go back to a, thus saith the Lord. We go back to a book, chapter, and verse approach. If not, we will never find the New Testament church as it should be. Because as we look out our windows, we see denominations where we should see churches that belong to the Lord, shouldn't we? What about some resistance to the restoration? Well, we know there is obvious resistance to, the restor to restoration, that is, restoring and going back to the Bible. We know we talk to those in the denominational world, they'll tell you over and over and over again, they follow the Bible. But yet we know if we do just a little bit of research, we'll find that really isn't true. 
The first thing we find that prevents people from being restored or going to the Bible and being a part of the Lord's church is the fact that they find tradition is more important and is more value over the Word of God. They choose their traditions over the Word of God. I remember when we were in another location, I had a brother tell me, well, you know, we have friends and family over here. And they tell me, well, we know, you know, some of the things going on here isn't right, but we've always gone here. You know, that is not an uncommon phrase. Just, and also we have to realize, just because we don't hear people verbalize, it doesn't mean there are, there are those in denominations who do not know better. The problem is, knowing better and doing nothing about it is not good enough on the Day of Judgment, is it? It takes a repentance and coming out of denominationalism and becoming a part of the New Testament church of which there is only one. There are numerous reasons given for those who will not depart from denominationalism. The reasons go back to a few simple points. The elevating tradition over the Word of God. And this has always been condemned as we look at Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Notice what Christ says here in Matthew 15, beginning in verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? You know, there's a problem in that question, isn't there? The problem is they're being accused of breaking tradition of what? Of men. Well, today we would say, we should say, if someone accuses us of breaking the tradition of men, our response could be, so what? Traditions of men are not on equal footing as the Word of God. But nonetheless, that's their accusation here in verse 1, or verses 1 and 2. They transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now this does not, I don't know, I think accurately mean that these individuals had unclean hands, that they were disgusting and eating. It could have been, we don't know. But we know as we look at the scribes and Pharisees and many people during this time period, they had an obsession with washing things, not just their hands. They'd wash their, their dishes, their pots, their furniture. They made it a big ordeal that came into a tradition of the elders. And so when the elders saw, or the scribes and Pharisees saw what, what Jesus and his disciples were doing, they immediately uh, go to him and say they are breaking the tradition of the elders. But notice verse 3 and how Christ responds. Why do you also, and notice he doesn't deny breaking the tradition of the elders, does he? Why do you also, meaning, he just, so what? It's a tradition of the elders. <clears throat> but notice he goes on to say, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition. He's saying your traditions are causing you to break the commandments of God. Now, now which one will cause you to go to hell? Not breaking the tradition of elders or men. That's what tradition of elders are. But if you break the commandment of God, it most certainly will result in a spiritual death sentence. Look at verse 4. For God commands, saying, Honor your father and your mother. Notice he goes, forget the washing of hands. He goes to what they're actually teaching others. He says, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you, but you say, Whoever says to his father and mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift of God. They need not honor his father and mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. He's saying, forget tradition. You're, you're breaking the commandments of God. You're not even teaching children to actually honor their father and their mother. Isn't it interesting how Christ says, traditions down here, the commandment of God is way up here, isn't it? Your traditions are causing you to break the commandments, the Word of God. Verse 7, he calls them hypocrites. He says, Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Doesn't that sound familiar today? We have people who say and do some very nice things, but they're not following the Word of God. We have those who are so involved and doing things out in the community, they forget they need to obey God when it comes to the first day of the week and to the rest of their lives. They're focused on doing good, but they forget the most good they can do is obeying the Word of God. 
He says, they draw near me through mouth and honor me through lips, but their heart, he says, is far from me. They do and say all these nice things, but they don't really know me. They're not really obedient. Look at verse 9. He says here, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines and commandments of men. They started out saying, You're breaking the tradition of the elders. And Christ points out, You're breaking the commandments of God. Well, one's going to go to hell. One's just going to upset somebody. You upset the elders. They break their tradition. You upset men. But you break the commandments of God. You put your eternal soul at risk. And that's the difference we find here. But we find, obviously, these individuals are putting their tradition above the commandments of God. Another resistance we find to restoration is emotionalism over God's commands. We hear so many times, well, I just enjoy and fill in the blank. It makes me feel good. It sounds good. My children love it. And that can be an emotional response. My children enjoy going here. They have a great time. You know, you never find in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, where Paul or David talk about how they had a great time worshiping God. They talked about what? How encouraging it was and how wonderful it was to praise the Almighty God. Did they enjoy it? Absolutely. But they don't enjoy it because of an entertainment factor. They don't enjoy it because their children enjoy it. They enjoy it because they were offering up true worship to God. And how we know that? Because they condemned false worship to God. Emotionalism cannot come over, be placed above God's commands. Emotionalism is not a substitute for verifiable faith. Faith based upon emotion may change from day to day. But faith based on God's Word is based on truth, and it does not change. Notice 1 John 5, verse 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now notice, that you may know. That you may know that you have eternal life. I can't tell you how many times I heard people say, I just don't feel like I'm saved. Why? Because you're having a bad day? Because you slipped up and said or did something you shouldn't, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian anymore. It means you need to repent, perhaps. But to say, I just don't feel like I'm saved anymore, that's an emotional response. That's a faith dependent upon emotions. I feel good today. Praise the Lord. I feel bad tomorrow. I don't feel like I'm saved. That's emotionalism, isn't it? What we find here in 1 John 5, verse 13, he reminds us that we can know who Christ is, and we can know that we are saved. He says there in verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now notice that you may know what? That you may know that you have eternal life. It's not a question. It's not a doubt. It's not a feeling. It's I know or I don't. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. It's not emotions. It is a verifiable fact. Are we saved if we obey God's word and continue to obey his word? Yes, you are saved. That's what John wants us to know. You can't know that you have eternal life. You don't have to guess or speculate or wonder about it. You can know that you do. You know, you would think... That would be a concept that people would be jumping at. But it seems that so many people today really enjoy this emotional concept in worship. You know, there's nothing wrong with when you're singing a song. If, you know, maybe you listen, you listen, as you're singing and listening to words, maybe you kind of had to pause for a second because you're thinking about the word and you get a little bit choked up. Have you ever had that happen? You think about that song, you could have sent 10,000 angels. That's a tough one sometimes. Think about what Christ could have done instead of dying on the cross. Or think about things such as amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Those are emotional songs. But we cannot allow our emotion to be our gauge on worship, on our praise, or in our salvation that belongs in Christ. What are some lessons 
for us today. Well, we want to notice why restoration is important. Because it is important. If we want to be a part of the church which Christ bought, bled, and died for, we have to open our Bibles to find out how we can be a part of it. And we find in Acts chapter 2, it began, and we find the entrance, and we find out how we can become a part of it, and also how we can remain in that church. Unless one is a part of the church, we find in the Bible, then salvation is not available to them. That means that salvation is not available outside of the body of Christ. You hear people say, you have to be a member of the church of Christ to be saved? Yes. That's exactly what that means. Do we say that to be rude or harsh? No, but that's what the Bible teaches. Christ built one church. You want to have salvation? You better be in it. Because it's not anywhere else. We can have our emotions and our traditions, but they're not going to be found in the body of Christ. In any church of Christ that begins to include, begin to include traditions of men and begin to remove the Bible, they're no longer a part of the body of Christ. That's what Revelation talks about. We find where Christ talks, gives warnings about how they must repent and change or He will come and remove their candlestick. What does that mean? You would no longer be recognized as part of my body because you have departed. Anytime we depart from the Bible, we stop either being in the body of Christ or for a congregation, we stop being the body of Christ. There's no other way about it. If we want to be the church, we have to do as the church was commanded to do from Christ, from the apostles, and how we are to follow their same commandments today. Because the moment we walk away from it, we are no longer the body of Christ. That reason alone is why it is so important to restore the true church and not merely to reform it. Reform means you change it. You know, sometimes we confuse restoration with reformation. Reformation means they change it. Martin Luther and others, reformation. They changed it into something else. Restoration means you go back to the Bible. You go all the, back, all the way back. Someone restores the vehicle, they take it all the way back, and they truly restore it. They take it all the way back to what, how it was when it rolled off the line, right? And that's how the church must be today. We roll it back to how it was in the Bible, because that's what we're supposed to be, the church of the Bible. We do not reform the church that Christ built, bled for, and died for. Instead, we are to honor it, be in it and restore it where it has deteriorated. Where it has crumbled, we must restore it. Where it has grown weak, we must strengthen it. And where it needs to begin, where it needs to be planted, if possible, we plant it. And the church grows by only following the words of God. How does restoration happen? Restoration can happen... All Restoration can only happens when God's word is restored as the sole authority. Look at Mark 1, 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They're referencing Christ. Why did he teach as one having authority? Because he does, he did, and he still does today. He taught as, as one having authority because he had authority. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Where is our authority? It must be from the Word of God. All Scripture is what? Given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's our authority. Why do we follow the Word of God? Because there's nothing else we can follow and be pleasing to God. There's no other book there's no creed, there's no tradition, there's no catechism, there's no bylaws. Those things do not exist in the Lord's church. You know why? Because it didn't exist when Christ built it. Only existed was His commands. And it reminds us over and over again that He alone has authority. Restoration will bring the unity that Christ des desires and the unity that He deserves. Look at John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. Here Christ says, I do not pray for these alone, 
but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they also may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have, and, may, and you have, have loved them as you have loved me. You notice the number of times we find the word one in just three verses? 23, 23, four verses, those one, one, one. And what was the reason behind that? Look what he says there in verse 20, uh, 21. That all may be one as you, Father, in, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That's why we are to be one. You look around, the one of the world is confused. Who wouldn't be? But if we want to teach people that Christ is the Son of God. We have to remind them, first of all, there's only one church. Paul reminds us of what? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, one Father of all, who is Lord of all, and what? Father of all, He is. There's one, 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 right? And so we think about, as we see this here in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23, one what? One body, one church, one authority. And it's not man. It belongs to Christ. It belongs to God. As Christians, we should pray for the church, the Bible, to be restored. Because if we look around, we know not only are denomination, denominations a hindrance, but we've had, we had some today who, among the bodies of Christ, had departed from the faith, haven't they? We see it all the time. It's not something we want to see. It's not something God wants to see. But we are not a Christian. We should desire to become a part of the church you can actually find and read about in the Bible. You know, when someone, you ask someone what church they attend and they tell you and it's some denomination ask them some time to show you that denomination in the Bible ask them to show you the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Catholic church Presbyterian church, you name it where is it? because if they're sincere they'll tell you it's not in there there's only one church, and that is the one we must be a part of and the one that must be restored if others, not just us, if others are to have the hope of heaven. This evening, as you think about these things, we can encourage you, pray for you, if you have any need whatsoever, we'd be glad to assist you. As we stand and sing the song that's been selected.